Hello, this is David Duval. I am delighted to be at the home of Jerome Rose, one of the world's major concert pianists, organizer of festivals, and indeed his festival in New York every summer, the International Piano Festival and Institute, has become in the last six or seven years one of the mainstays for young pianists in the world and Jerome brings over some of the world's great pianists. So there are master classes and there are lectures. And I have known Mr. Rose for many years. He has played in things I have done. I have performed in things he has done. And he is what I call an ideal colleague because of one very special issue. He is not for himself. He is for the world of music for the young pianists, and he's really a phenomenal teacher, as almost everyone, indeed, that has studied with him knows. He's made so many CDs. Of course, his renown earlier, after winning the Buzzoni competition in Bolzano, was his tremendous deed. We could call it a deed, a good deed indeed, because nobody was playing all of the list works that he did at that time. But the chunks of literature that Jerry Rose has put to CD always is intriguing because he's one of the great formal thinkers. Schubert, the great sonatas, Schumann, the sonatas, and all of this can be had on CD. This is his first DVD, and I am so pleased to be with him. I want him to say hello. Good evening, David Dubal. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, let me just say it's the International Keyboard Institute and Festival, which is one of the foremost piano festivals. And thank you with your cooperation and participation uh, at this now time, 2007. We are now in the ninth season. And uh, the occasion of doing this uh, short uh, video is that uh, it's the uh, announcing my first commercially made DVD of the uh, four ballades of Chopin and the two sonatas and I'm delighted that you're here that that we can discuss at length these great works Jerome these are not only great works these are immortal works that seem to touch the soul of humanity well, like all great works of art, they mirror humanity and they make humanity worth living. And of course, Chopin being one of the great men of all time, in, in, in not only in music, but the, the poet of, of genius and, uh, and also the, the, the well, I should even say the popular poet of genius, because the phenomenon of this man of, is, is that from the very moment he wrote the, the earliest short waltzes, mazurkas, his popularity has never waned for one moment in the history of, of music and in many ways the history of art. Oh, absolutely. This is, uh, this is, as James Honecker once said, the open door to the East. He was so magnificently exotic when he first entered that people never heard music like this. And of course, this new fragrant chromaticism was just uh, too exotic to be believed. People would would just run out to get those mazurkas and try to play in the Polish manner. Well, the, the, the phenomenon, of course, is that is that he appeals to the the least sophisticated musical listener and 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 the most sophisticated. Musical How do listener. you account for that? Because I have not. Is... I've never. I've never quite understood yeah. this phenomenon. The complexity of the music, the challenge of study, the the constant. Uh, resurrecting of, of the art and, and the constant appreciation, and yet the simplicity of the message, which absolutely goes to the heart of any human being. Every, any, everyone loves Chopin. This is, the, this is a phenomenon. There's yes, no if, composer in the world like this. If someone said, I don't love Chopin, you would say, you are out of your minds. What's wrong with you? And, and not, not only that, but I mean, this is one of the great pillars of, of, of the piano repertoire. I mean, you cannot Think of the piano without Chopin. Oh, the so, whole the whole repertoire, the whole career of pianist would be in jeopardy. Think of it. Well, so the, so the, many concerts have been all Chopin. What other composer could fill hall after hall? No, the, 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 it is a phenomenon. The, the the uniqueness, of course, is 
the genius is, is, uh, that you find is the, the absolute imagination of, of, of the rhythmic pulse and, and, and the phenomenal sense of counterpoint, harmony, and melody, and the, uh, the absolute attraction. It, the instant you hear a, a measure of Chopin, it is immediately identified as this composer. It's quite yes. phenomenal. Uh, you, one of your idols, Arthur Rubinstein, said the moment you touch Chopin on the piano, there's a breath of relief almost in the audience because it's of a recognition, and yet there's such room for the interpretation. There is there's great room for the, the 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 other thing, of course, is he was such a magnificent pianist himself, and and it is such a joy to make this music come alive. You don't have to struggle, of course, you have to struggle to to interpret it on on that level, but the, it just lays in the hand. The man understood the instrument, he understood the hand, he understood the entire mechanism of playing the instrument. Yes. It's really it's really quite extraordinary. It becomes a new instrument and it has every possible shade of human emotion in it. He he was just uh he he was what what uh Goethe said a a biological mutation uh of a, a of a perfection something beyond our understanding of perfection. The enigma, of course, of Chopin is where did he come from? You know, Gelo Zolovola, this little, uh, uh, absolutely outside of uh, Warsaw, there was a little bit of a village yes. born. His, his mother certainly did not have any great uh, musical lineage. Yes. Uh, the father, of course, uh, taught French. He was uh, basically French, uh, transplanted into Poland. Uh, there's nothing that would uh, emit a, 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 a genius. Certainly, somebody like Mendelssohn, you could understand where it came of from, or, or for that matter, the, the, the Franz Liszt in his father, uh, Mozart in his father. You know all of this. Yes, but there is nothing in the uh, there's in nothing the in the Chopin. Chopin. There's nothing, what and he, even even his teachers. None of the teachers were men uh, of, of international repute. My I mean, goodness, not even not even a piano teacher. Zvigny was a violinist and a poor one. Exactly. Uh, one good thing he did was to give Chopin one of the things he loved dearest in his life in music was the uh, love of Bach. And uh, we can thank Zvigny for that, but Elsner was a was a composition teacher who, who understood he had a great exotic bird on his hand and he didn't interfere much. And so, I think where part, did he come from? Wow. I think I think what what you what you find I think because of the genius, uh, like so many great genius, he was able to hear, absorb, integrate, and project what went into his mind is and entered into his oral uh, library. Yeah. The the phenomenal memory and how by integrating, like, like one of these marvel marvelous computers that has fed phenomenal information, he was able to distill that into his own identity. And I think this is the, the true genius of this, of this individual, that anything that he heard was used. It was just regurgitated in, and, and in, in ingested in, in the most magnificent way. Yeah, everything was perfect about his mental mechanism as well, knowing very well that he must compose only for the piano. All of that was integrated into the whole. He, he understood this, but but yes. uh, very clearly, uh, from 13, 14, 15 years of age, he was absolutely able to identify his own style, his own genius, the way he heard music, and of course the the miracle, of course, of the two concerti, which still are living monuments, composed before he was 20 years of age. Quite yes. quite extraordinary. The the uh, slow movements alone are opera scenes of the most exquisite. Uh, caliber and that reminds us to to discuss the fact that beside all of the 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 aspects of music going on uh, from the mazurkas to the waltzes uh, here is a um, a man that loves the human voice transplants it um, to the piano and is not even interested himself in composing an opera or songs basically the 17 songs have really no meaning in the output but here on the piano is Possibly one of the most vocal uh, composers that ever well, once lived. Once again, I know anything he heard was absorbed. Yeah. Anything, anything. Of course, uh, uh, of course, being being such a great musician, he was able to transpose and transcribe the human voice into the instrument of the piano. And of course, being a genius of a pianist, 
through the use of, as we all know, it isn't just that right hand melody, it's all the other voices which create that magnificent tone and that magnificent sound. And uh, of course, this is sine qua non in the sense of the, 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 the voicing of the instrument how, and how the instrument sings. Mm -hmm. It's really quite extraordinary. Quite yes, extraordinary. just look at a, a naive field nocturne and then a Chopin late spiritualized example like the E well, flat over the, 55. But also, but, but I mean, uh, and of course, Franz Liszt, Franz Liszt loved Field. And of course, the, the, the influence of Field is... is, is oh, it's is. wonderful. Field was a wonderful, wonderful minor master. But the, you know how the spillover of, of the, the Italian influence, which, which, which came through, of course, all these opera houses had, had Italian masters living there and singing there and so on. And his love of Bellini, Donizetti, and all the great, great artists, and not to mention the, his love of Mozart. Which, uh, which is well documented, uh, and the 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 ob the obvious thing how he was able to to create music drama, and of course the ballads and their their dramatic appeal, and of course the great musical forms of the sonatas, and there, these are epic epic dramas. You have to see them as 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 of course we always say the condensation of life itself. But the, the epic proportions of this music and the fact, and certainly in the case of the sonatas and even in the case of the blots, he lived with these pieces. They, they just didn't flow out of him. He composed it in great detail, going over and over and over again until he found his own perfection within these works. Oh yes, the, the B flat minor sonata, this is the this is a music drama uh, of life and death going on. It's well, unbelievable. The, the, once again, you, you, you find in Chopin, this is not just the sweet, lovely, nocturnal individual. This is the man of possessed. I would say this is um, a Dostoevsky character, certainly as, as demonstrated in, in the sonatas and, and, and very often in the ballads, the, the, the codas of, of, of certainly the, the F major ballad oh, or the G minor ballad. Yes. All of the codas uh, are, are, are steaming in their energy and in their fer yes. ferocity. You know, uh, you could work on those codas alone <laughs> till et in eternity itself flows over. Well, you do work on them. <laughs> you work, you, you, they, they are an, an, an eternal task. And, and the beauty of any masterpiece is, is it is never mastered by its very nature. It's Jerome never mastered. Jerome Rose, tell me this. Uh, what have been your most successful Chopin encounters with the public? knowing, of course, that public love Chopin, but when you give them a, the four ballades, you're giving them a lot of material. Well, the, the beauty of Chopin is you can never, there's, not, there's, there's no such thing as too much Chopin. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the beauty. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, and like, like all great composers, there is not one single composition which is like any other composition, even, if, even of, the, of all the mazurkas. They are completely unique, completely individual. Mm -hmm. Not one is like any other. Not one melody is similar to the others. And it's like the, the, the genius just keeps flowing and flowing and flowing. And uh, if you look at the four laws of the two sonatas, there's not, a, there's not one theme similar to any other theme. And the perfection, not just of piano writing, but of musical composition. Well, obviously, uh, in the case of the B flat minor, he lived with this for a long, long period. But the, the, uh, what, what, what is so, so, real to me is it isn't just compositionally working on it he worked on the the emotional transitions within the music the the epic and evocative moments which stream into each other yeah that's a in a way a stream of consciousness that makes this music come alive and in, in indeed it is transcendental this is a a another is otherworldly yes there's no doubt about it and uh the the constant pains in creating this perfection go through his whole life when at the end he begs he begs his friends Fontana especially his Polish compatriot please burn all of my music that is not published I do not want the public to ever have anything but the best of me well of he's course conscious of that he's conscious of that and of course this was not done and there were many, many pieces, uh, masterpieces that are considered certainly the fantasy impromptu, which he never expected to publish, and, yes. and, and the E minor waltz was never expected to be published. Either. And uh, and I'm I'm grateful 
that his my sense of perfection yes. is not is not nearly equal to his. Yes, because these are all wonderful, aren't they're they? They're absolutely, absolutely. We wouldn't wonderful. want to miss any of those we posthumous not, pieces. You know. The other thing is, at what point in his life did he know that his life was going to be brief? At what point did he realize, similar to Schubert in the, the famous 1820 year of 1828, where he wrote un, unending masterpieces? And in the case of Chopin, he must have realized that he had to get it down on paper. Yes. And he must, uh, he must realize, and it is, to me, it is autobiographical. Yes. Jerry, I think that that moment comes at Mallorca in 1837. Uh, I think that this is the beginning of the pulmonary uh, coughing spells that never left him, that would, of course, abate for, for certain amounts of time. Uh, but and of course, he became a social reject in yeah. Mallorca at the oh. time. They they they, they, wouldn't, they 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 thought he was a diseased man, and they 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 sort of shunned him completely at that point. Yeah, one of his letters is so ironic. The uh, three leading doctors all said that you know, in one way or another, he was already dead. <laughs> but he had you know uh, he had a past. You know, uh, the sister uh, Isabella died uh, at fourteen of uh, tuberculosis. And so many people did, but in this case, uh, it was a complicated. No doctor could actually come up with with saying this is really uh, consumption, and so there's always been controversy about exactly the cause of his causes of his death. But but the main issue is that my goodness, I think by thirty, uh, by twenty seven or twenty eight, he knew that he didn't have a long life ahead of him. Well, very clearly, but I. Everyone thinks, well, it's marvelous to be a genius, and I think in the case of Chopin and well, so many of the, the truly great figures in, in music, I think it was a, a, a terrible burden uh, meeting his muse and 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 uh, succumbing to what his great gifts were and, and being a slave to his great great gifts. Yes, and and Jerry, he was not only a slave to that perfection, he was a man. Who had no sponsorship in life, you know, forget the fact that. Well, uh, I often, uh, when I'm giving piano lessons and I'm thinking, uh, let's say it's not the best of the students, and I'm thinking, who am I to complain? Look what Chopin had to do to survive. <laughs> yes, here was a man that comes a little too early to really make any money from the concert platform, mm. as Liszt would. You know, it's a, uh, uh, um, they usually say, well, you know, he wouldn't have done it, he didn't like it, but of course there was. No such thing as the solo recital. He made, gave one in his life in Edinburgh in 1848, 49. But other than that, and he begged his, his friend Osborne from the Paris days, please, please don't come. It's too big a haul for me. But the point is, is that he worked his mind and heart as a teacher constantly, sometimes eight to 10 hours a day. He was well paid, but he had expensive tastes and I think he deserved every one of them. Well, one wonders the, the, the development in his own pianistic development, how much in terms of teaching and how much in terms of, of the study of the instrument and, the, and his ability to convey, because apparently, according to all the documentation, he was an absolutely brilliant teacher. Yes. And how he, he, this whole development of the use of the instrument and the sound of the instrument and the qualities of the instrument and how he's always searching, searching, and discovering, and of course, uh, you can see, you can trace the whole development. What I find so so incredible is that from from there's basically hardly any change. Of course, the, this there's an enrichment of style, but the style seems to be set already in the concerti when he's 18 years of age. Oh sure, uh, which which is sort of phenomenon. When yes. you think this is Chopin, this is who he is. The genius is established. Bang, and through the next 20 years, he's yes. he's, he's still there. Yes. The, the enrichment, the uh, spiritual riches that come uh, are all put upon a style that had been formed uh, perfectly. Besides that, the, the genius and the inventiveness of how the music and the pianism is so perfectly blended, yes. the, the imagination of how the hand is used to create these colors and the designs and, and, and the, the, the motivic uh, transformations which he's able to create, I find it's it's a constant fascination. You know this this uh, this short life. I, I I could weep when I think that the last three years there's only three four pages of music. A little mazurka that he was too weak to uh, to notate himself. The Opus 68 number four. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of other 
pieces, and that's it. He was he was well, literally he, a walking corpse. He withered. He withered completely. And um, thank God for Jane Sterling, who took care of him in his final years. Yes, but yes. they they were they were really very tragic, very tragic years. Ironically, uh, the 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 cause of the rift with George Sand. The daughter was the one who was with him in the moment he died. So Lange was there. Yes, and he that took love, her side uh, in the family issues, and uh, that was the end. George Sun had to put her foot down. Uh, she didn't want him to play father, but I also think she had been weary of the difficulty of being the lover of Chopin. Well, I, I think one of the no, we we all know the biography, and and as as I'd visited Noah. There's not one trace of his ever having been there. She she completely res you know completely redid the room. Uh, there there is a padded door where the studio used to be, but there's no remnant of the life that they had together. That's so interesting because these are her most productive years as well. Um, history well, history is always fascinating and um, and human relationship and human relationship always fascinating as always well, going Jerry. on we are all we are all entranced with it it was a it was a a, a life and of course the internal life of a Chopin is, is 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 impossible to even estimate no we can't really go into that inner life it must have been so subtle and so refined Jerry it's been so great to be with Jerome Rose on this DVD. Thank you, David Dubal, for being here.